Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another season of the Ringside Nutrition Podcast. Today, I'm joined by an exercise physiologist and high performance coach working in high level of boxing, Andrew Usher. Andrew, I've been really excited to get this podcast recorded. We've been chatting for a while about all things physiology, boxing and sports science. Thanks for taking the time, mate, to, to jump on with me. That's great. No, I'm really looking forward to it. So it should be quite an interesting chat, I think. So we've spoken, mate, about like your background and what you do, but there's no better person to explain it. I'm not going to explain what you do and butcher it. So for the listeners, you're probably a bit of a guy behind the shadows, it's fair to say. Tell everybody what you do um, and the kind of process which you use with the fighters or boxers that you work with up in Scotland. Right. So I'll do an abridged version of my background because it probably explains where I'm coming from. So I grew up in the late 70s, 80s, which means I'm pretty old, a dinosaur. And back then, you could only really do a couple of sports, football and boxing or karate. So I did all three. And then in my late teens, um, met this girl and was taken to the dark side of Muay Thai kickboxing and started doing Muay Thai, fought overseas a little bit, took a really bad injury to my forehead, ended up getting like a, a puff pots, um, potty tumor, uh, which was corroding the, the bone. Um, so then I had to get surgery and then being quite naive, thought, you know, nothing much, but I'm quite in, invincible. Uh, only to discover that I can get a license to fight anywhere else. My fighting career had kind of come to a pretty sharp, sharp exit. So what do you do? You've got to coaching. So I ended up coaching Muay Thai and boxing for quite a lot of years. And then in my 30s, started to really think that a lot of the way we were taught was like a coach taught a coach that taught a coach that taught a coach. And there was no sports science or evidence behind anything we were doing. And I'd go to conferences and I'd sit and think there must be a better way of training people. There must be a much better way to see a performance outcome. So from my 30s almost just get kind of really deep into sports science, um, did a lot of postgraduate courses in sports therapy uh, and all that type of thing. Uh, went, opened a medical practice with my wife, which was a bit of an eye opener as well. And because she's a GP, we run the practice and then just organically started to look at performance as a whole position between tie in biomechanics to, to nutrition and, and all that stuff because we wanted to make athletes better healthier and stronger and then just kind of kept doing that really for a lot of years consulted with a lot of ufc fighters belter fighters over the years had my own gym closed it and the last few years um started working up at aberdeen with uh, northern sporting club which is uh, david McAllister. mccallister has got a big name up there david's a super amazing guy great coach very similar ethos it's all about the fighters not necessarily about the money it's about up-and-comers making sure they get longevity in their career. And for a sense, lets me do crazy sports science. So we have a, a kind of like a, a, a really a modern take on probably boxing performance from an A to Z. So we have an A to Z blueprint, which we'll get into. And it's pretty good. I have my own business, of all performance, where I work. Uh, I predominantly work with everybody from Jane Pops, see a lot of patients uh, from medical practices that need to deal a bit of weight and that type of stuff, uh, right through to triathletes, uh, ultra runners, kind of, Falling for that a little bit myself, you know, a couple of hundred K runs and stuff. Um, and it's just the same process, really. The only thing I don't tend to do is work with boxers in my private practice. I tend to leave that to Aberdeen because any conflicts of interest. In. And I'm like super geeky. Even in the late 40s, I'm like just waiting for them to develop bionic arms and shit because I am like into science and, and technology and gadgets like nobody else to the dismay of my wife. So that's kind of it, really, in a nutshell. Because it's fair to say that you're right in regards to that. You get coached and then that coach then coaches another coach and then that coach then coaches the coach below them and it kind of this you know education or the way of doing things just spirals down throughout the generations and you're right with the whole sports science scene there doesn't seem to be a lot of people really jumping on with the whole sports science bandwagon and really kind of bringing it to the forefront of boxing which is obviously like what you do so it'd be really cool yeah. to hear about that blueprint, that A to Z blueprint they use with the fighters. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it is changing a little bit. I mean, I've, I've always got a, a British board trainer's license as well. So I can kind of coach pros as a, a trainer. So I can do a lot of like cornering. Um, and I've got obviously got all the Boxing Scotland badges as well for that. And I was impressed with the, the last course of the British board with Kevin, uh, uh, who does all the, the training there. Kevin's like ex-military and big into sports science. And, and my course that was really good day two is we get into a lot of big discussions and strength conditioning and squat positions and stuff. And I was, Kevin's, Kevin's amazing coach. So it is changing from that level where it's not changing is at the coaching level. Mm. So I, you still see a lot of amateur coaches that are basically volunteers in amateur world. So it's hard to expect a lot from them because they are volunteers, but at the actual education side, it's, 
it's still not what it needs to be. Box in Scotland are doing really good things. They've got a new level one and level two course. They'll try to introduce a lot more concepts. But I still think it's difficult if you're an amateur coach and you don't have a lot of time to really like do a two-day course and then go away and synthesize all that's pretty difficult. Uh, I think for pro coaching varies for me. Sometimes we get really good coaches. Um, and sometimes we get we see coaches that need a lot more education. Um, but I think what there is a lack of is critical and objective thinking from a coaching perspective. You know, I think it's easy on Instagram to throw up a research paper, read the abstract, and think you've just developed a whole new process. <laughs> you know, I always say to kind of younger coaches, like you need, you know, you need to the abstract, the conclusion, and the middle bit of the paper, because the middle bit of the paper is where the, the meat and potatoes is. The conclusion isn't necessarily what you should be developing your sports lines necessarily on. That's that's a big issue, I think. You see it quite a lot. The joys of Instagram. Yeah, social media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I, I wish I actually really put that. It's funny, the running joke in Aberdeen is neither me or David like to be in the limelight at all. So I, I as soon as media turns up, one of us is going for coffee. Um, it's just it's bizarre. It's like it's really bizarre for me because I had a side business, which is a media company, and we did we did filming for the UFC and we did, uh, I've worked, worked in Hollywood movies and visual effects, but I just hate, I hate media. It's really bizarre. It's also, it's also like another stress as well, which I've seen. It's also just another added stress for the actual fighters themselves. They've now, they now kind of feel they, they have to have an Instagram account to promote themselves and put photos of them sparring or their profile. Yeah. And before it would have just been, they would have just been a good amateur. They would have been a good pro and they would have just built up their record and their performances would have done the talking like you, your work would have just, mm done the yeah. talking yeah it's time to change i mean i i i mean i've been really lucky in 25 years being self-employed i've never really had to advertise so and i'm also very lucky that i get to pick and choose my clients so to work for me to work with someone there has to be some kind of interest in them and some interest in their career path or where they're at and i like it's funny because i prefer working with up-and-comers because i think there's a better room for change you you can do a lot more with them you can do nutritional intervention in the early stage you can really introduce some concepts you can really develop them and they can get more out of their career path. Working with like, and I've been offered loads of like number one, number two world uh, champs and all stuff. It just doesn't really interest me. Mm. Uh, getting someone, the journey is more of interest to me than actually at the end point. I think the end point they've achieved what they want to achieve. I like being part of the, the early stage journey. And that's what kind of interests me. And process process driven, not goal driven, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, I just think it's more exciting. I think, you know, and I think it's also, you can change mindsets and behavioral patterns at a much earlier stage you know and uh and i think that for us in aberdeen is one of the big things is the wellness of boxers and the longevity of career that's that's a massive thing for us we're really all about making sure that they're not overtraining they're eating right mm. everything's in place because we want them to go on and do really really well um so it's so probably quite a, a good little close-knit team and everyone bounces off each other and it's a very open environment it's very kind of open to questions and it's, it's, it's good it's healthy it's probably the best training gym i've been in a lot of years and i've had my own gym and it wasn't as good as this <laughs> that doesn't say much does it <laughs> so no so if i was a boxer in scotland i'm an upcoming um professional coming through the ranks and i've got a lot of talent and i come to your gym with the other guys david and stuff um Talk me through the process of what it would be like if we started working together and you want to invest in me and you want to take me on as a client. So what would, we, what would the process be? Right. So if you were coming in and we were kind of interested in you, you were interested in us, we would do, the first thing we always do is a movement assessment. That's the first thing I do with all boxes. Well, I think I would, I think I'd struggle with that one, but. Yeah. So we do it. <laughs> we do it all of them. And it's, I mean, I'm going to mention Dean Salon. They don't hate me mentioning him. Um, one of our pros, but Dean's a good example of that, that cracking kickbox or cracking box or, Great S and C, you know, uh, previous coach, etc. But when he came in, he had some of the poorest mobility and stability I'd ever seen in my entire life. No range in his ankle, dorsiflexion was really restricted. No stability on one leg, you know. And that straight away was a red flag to us. We were like, well, power comes from you know from the ground up, and you need to kind of unilateral and bilateral movement. So it all has to be cleaned up. So movement is the first thing we do. We do a screening process. We look to make sure that the ankle's in good position, the knee's stable, the hips in good position, shoulder can come through. That's the first thing we always do. And then off of that, we'll do some basic low-level physiological testing. So we may look at times on runs. We may look at cognitions. We use some interactive lights. We're looking at benchmarking, you know, your cognition, how you're seeing things in your peripheral vision. Uh, then we'll do heart rate training. We'll have a look at kind of resting rates recovery between, you know, a bag session. 
And then we made a little bit deeper sports science depending on the person. So we use the moxie sensors and look at oxygen saturation and desaturation. And at the end of that conversation, we sit and go, these are the things that you're doing really amazing. These are the things that may need a little bit of work. And these are the things that we would change. And that's kind of the first step in our blueprints. So we look at that and go, that's what we want. Then if they're interested in that approach, because not everyone wants that type of approach. For sure, yeah. Then we'll go into a much bigger discussion about nutrition, what they're taking, how they're taking it, what they're probably what they're understanding nutrition is, because that varies greatly. We've got some kids that are phenomenally on point on nutrition, and we've got some that uh, are not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm going to say on that. Or it's just probably not as good as yeah. it should be. No, no, I, I feel um, you. I feel you on that one. I'm. I could drop a few names, but um, we'll yeah. keep we'll keep them confidential in case I get knocked out. Yeah. Um, how did you found found the reaction to the fighters going through that kind of like intense baseline period of battery of tests? Has there been some fighters who have gone, yeah, like you just said, that's not for me, or this is too much, or how? What's the reaction kind of been when you first get them in and say, hey, this is our way of working. This is what you've got to do. Are they quite receptive to it? Do they understand it? How do you kind of relay the information? I think it. I think it depends, and I think it depends on where they're on the career. Um, we're lucky that most of them are at a point now they don't care less what I put on their legs. If this sensor goes on here or that sensor, goes on, they know something's going to occur. Um, so they, they don't care less uh, about it. But I, I, I would say that probably all of them are starting to really see a massive benefit and you know, movement, you know, speed, hand speed changes because we all have 3D motion capture. Um, just general conditioning through rounds, um, the recovery, the education on the recovery, you know, how they should sit in the stool, you know, they shouldn't close a diaphragm over all that type of stuff. Right mm -hmm. down to kind of thermal regulation between rounds, you know, like some, you know, this is a big area that we can this later on, but it's a big area that's not been looked at either is how much can you actually take some of these temperature down but in a round with ice and you can't. You know, you can't change core temperature that quick. But what we do with athletes is, is find out what feels more appeasing to them. So do they like ice in their hands? Do they like it in the forearms? Because that psychologically drives another performance metric. So, so we do a lot of stuff and it just depends, but we do scale it back. So if somebody comes in and goes, you know what, I kind of like this, but I'm really not interested in that. Or I like this and I've got my SNC coach in place already and I love the guy and that's fine. We, we kind of very much like a jigsaw puzzle. We just piece it all together and go, mm -hmm. right, okay, we can give you this, we can give you that. But we would like your SNC coach to be very communicative. So we, we can, uh, from our point of view, from the nutrition upwards, everything has to be joined up. So we need to know if they've got a physio, what the physio is doing and why they're doing it. Why the SNC coach is doing what they're doing. Is there a deload? Is there not a deload week? You know, are they working power metrics? Are they working? What are they working? Because at the end of the day, you want all of this to come together to get the optimal condition. So, so we're lucky we've got a good team of people that kind of, having said that, I am, the majority of the team of people because I do the sports therapy as well. Yeah. I'm like, you know, so I'm a bit of a control freak. Make, um, the tea, make the teas and coffees as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> somebody does go up for Starbucks every <laughs> once every six years or something. So apparently, we're still waiting on that. Happening. But yeah, so that's it. Was a much from a boxing point of view, we're probably a lot more integrative than a lot of other boxing setups. Yeah, and that's just because they let me do what I want to do and they've got an interest in it as well. So it's allowed us to formulate a different approach, which is more multifaceted. So it's more about looking at what is performance as a whole mm. rather than rather than having an SNC coach doing this and nobody really knowing why he's doing it. Because you as a, say for instance, me as a nutritionist can never get the best result from just saying, okay, well, I don't care about the SNC. I don't care about whatever kind of rehab he's doing. Um, I just want to get the nutrition spot on it doesn't work like that. So if you were to get the best, if I wanted to get the best out of that fighter, I'd want to know what SNC they're doing, how many rounds they're sparring, yeah. what the intensity is like, what their recovery is like, what their living conditions are, everything from family life. Because if you don't know any of that stuff, you're not going to get the best result out of them. So I really like that. And I've been in environments, mate, where, you know, the coaches are just, just don't want to know. They just don't think nutrition is important or they don't think the SNC is important for a boxer. They just think, yeah, well, he's talented. He'll get through it. But I don't know what you've seen, but I think times are changing and it isn't the case anymore really of just, uh, you know, you're talented, you're talented, talented amateur, tam um, talented pro. That doesn't automatically mean now that you're just going to automatically win, does it? No, I think you're right. And I think this is something that needs to change. I think the perception of a nutritionist needs to change. And I think there's some areas that, so for example, I think this whole idea that you're only using nutritionists to make weight is just a false 
Well, it's, oh, it's, it's, bull, really... it's bullshit, mate. I'll use the it right words. Bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> and, I th- and I think this comes down to, and I'm going to say this and probably people will hate me for this, but I think this comes down to a lot of MMA nutritionists that don't know anything about nutrition. They've never done any decent qualification other than a couple of these water loading ones. And their whole approach is they think a couple of Instagram pictures are kind of, you know, some rice and olives, you know, and then de- dehydrate for three weeks is a great way of, of approaching it. And they don't understand the performance degradation that occurs from that and anything else. And then it gets pumped on social media and everyone thinks this is the way you should go about it. And, and they lose track of the performance nutrition is much more than weight cutting. It's about making sure you're fueled adequate for training sessions. If you're injured, you're maybe getting some collagen supplementation or you're getting a whole heap of things to allow your recovery to process them will happen much quicker. Yeah. Adaptation physiologically needs to take in place, whether a boxer has to hypertrophy up or, or maybe come down a little bit. So much more to it than I think people realize. And I think in Aberdeen, that was probably the biggest shocker for them. It's that it's not just, you know, nutrition is fundamental to everything we do. So if we're going to have them on an S and C cycle and we're maybe looking at eccentric loading because we want to kind of maybe kind of strengthen tendons and ligaments, we have to adapt to nutrition to meet those requirements. From a cellular biology point of view, we need this protein synthesis to occur. So we need to have the right amount of ingredients going into the, you know, into the mix. And yeah. our guys now appreciate that. So they now know that they need to take X, Y, and Z and why they need to take the X, Y, and Z. And we want to kind of inform them. But you just have to listen to kind of commentary in boxing. You know, always oh, got a nutritionist on board to help him make him weight. It's like, well, um, I made the way easy this time. I made the way easy. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have to dehydrate and uh, be in a sauna, mm. put a sauna suit on a, on a bike running or jogging. Or, yeah, it drives me crazy all of this. I mean, even now, though, you see sports nutritionists working with athletes that are still dehydrating them, like really cutting them to the bone in the last couple of weeks. And we just mm. don't do that. You know, we want all fighters to appreciate their sport, to appreciate that they need to be within a percentage of range out with their fight so they're at a reasonable weight their snc is all done it that way so the power transfer and the contractile elements of the muscle tissue are all in place yeah uh, rather than this crazy mindset that still exists or you know it's all about size and things. well when you go back to that like i don't know what you call them uh, weight cut specialists or experts yeah. or, or whatever you want to call them I, I, I know some guy that i work with now fighter i work with that had carbs cut like three and a half weeks out and we're still doing some spars and then got to fight night obviously reloaded with carbs and stuff um did a carbohydrate load then got in the ring and his his conversation i had with him was like he just didn't feel like he knew how to put his foot on the acceleration pedal he was just stuck on the yeah. brake pedal he couldn't actually get move his foot across he couldn't he his body didn't know how to use that fuel source and i said well yeah because you you've trained six sparring sessions using a different fuel source you've been trying to use diesel and now all of a sudden you want to use high octane yeah what's yeah, that's w- it, yeah. what 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 do you feel is going to happen um and that's a consequence of yeah working with someone that was literally just focused on all i'm employed for is getting this person to make that weight no focus at all on i need this guy to perform well in his sparring because his confidence will be up or i need him to you know protect his immunity in the last three weeks it's it is you're so right them it's there needs to be kind of like a mindset shift. Let's go, let's go back and talk about mate, the, the testing cycle. So mm. you do all of the movement screening and bits and bobs like that. What about like uh, metabolic testing is what, what sort of yeah. procedures do you use there? So we will do RMR cause it's kind of a nice value to have. Um, we will do RMRs a lot more regular than people do. Cause we want to look at, you know, the changes week to week in camp. So we want to see whether inflammation is in a process, uh, you know, whether they're kind of adhering to diet because, you know, you can see this in the RER a lot of times reflect, especially if they go ketogenic and you get kind of some strange wonky numbers. Uh, we will do a VO2 max test. I, I, I personally am not a massive lover of VO2 max testing. I, I, I kind of I actually kind of wonder why we do it. Um, I think it's a much, very much an arbitrary value. It doesn't really mean a lot to a boxer. Uh, it lets them look at their gamma and watch them and go, wow. You know, you still, do you still use them now with pretty much all of the boxes which come through Not that process? Them, no. Or? no, what I've done more now is as part of my kind of most post-grad research is do field testing. So what I'd rather do, if we can do it uh, with a Cosme K5 or even the Pinoy uh, at times, is look at evaluating substrate testing on a pad session. Mm-hmm. Because I want to have a true reflection of what their split of carbohydrates and fats are during an intensity rise and peak. So I want to see those three minutes on the pads. I want to see the recovery rate. And I want to see later rounds, 
how their substrate's been utilized. That's more important to me than a, a VO2 max. So kind of like for the guy, for you guys listening, it's kind of, um, I'll try to put words in your mouth here, Andrew, but <laughs> trying to look at the amount of energy or the different energy sources yeah. being used yeah. basically during a boxing session, as opposed to running on a treadmill because you're yeah. a boxer and we want to see what energy uh, yeah. sources you're using at X intensity during your actual sport, not just running on a treadmill. Yeah. So it's taking so, it to that next level, isn't it? Of, so what, so what we, we, we're obviously quite a, quite a nice little setup. So what we're doing is we are, you've got obviously the mask on, the Bane mask, and you're measuring the calves and the fats, but we've also got trackers, 3D trackers measuring the hand speed. And we've also got sensors looking at specific muscles and, and what the oxygen is. And what we are looking at is what is the effect in later rounds, you know? Because what you tend to see a lot of box, especially heavyweights in later rounds is they try to adjust for a lack. When they fatigue, what happens is they swing for the hills, right? The haymakers come out because they feel that's the best way of getting power. They think power is just throwing their whole body into it. So what we try and teach them is, is that that's not necessarily true, that we need to manage how they manage their energy in rounds so that when they're throwing their hands, everything is mechanically right. So the energy system is used properly and the power ratio is there. So we do that through all this sensor collection and we sit with the athlete, we film the session, we say, right, this is where you're starting to lose some speed in your hands. And if you look at that, now you're, purely building carbohydrates because you're kind of into a much higher intensity. And then we go, but look at this, when you recovered and you started listening to what you're being told, suddenly your fats and carbs are a bit more even across the board. And what we are trying to do is, because science is too much for everyone, it's too much for me most of the time, and our amateurs and pros are like, what the fuck? Um, you know, it's like a Star Trek lesson. So what we try to do now is have them on feel. So we will say, how did that bit of this session feel for you? And then we'll relate it to the data and say, right, so the data says the same. So we're trying to teach them autonomy to regulate breathing frequency. And, and I think um, not a lot of people are field testing doing this. It is pretty difficult to do. We've done enough of it now that we can roughly uh, do a nice profile looking at how a, how a boxer is going to be on a treadmill, how he's going to be on a bag, how he's going to be on the pads. Can't do it sparring, unfortunately, but there is other things you can do with the moxie sensors. Um, so we can build a blueprint and amalgamate it and say, well, we know running, you should be burning this amount. And we know when you're on the pads, you're burning this amount. And on the bag, you're burning this amount. And this is why you're burning this. So that gives us a bit more detail as well in weight cut phases. So for example, we can say, right, on his treadmill 5K at pace, he's only utilizing 340 calories expended roughly. But on the bag, for the same amount of time, he's maybe doing 500. So we can prescriptively change what we want in the training camp. We can say, right, let's just bend the run and spend more time in the bag to get a bit more of a calorie deficit happening through expenditure. And that mm. allows us to change that up a lot as well, rather than the conventional thing about, let's just do loads of running. Mm. Yeah, something, some, something which I spoke to um, David Stash on one of my episodes about, where we spoke about the whole, oh yeah, let's do like a 10K run or let's do some road runs. Um, with, there's no thought process behind it. It's just like, let's just run 40 miles a week or whatever. You're actually saying that fighters could potentially benefit from doing... <laughs> hey, presto, more actual boxing sessions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you think about that as well, because you think about running. So, I mean, uh, we, we do run and we benchmark run. So we have specific targets that we want our athletes to hit. And we know roughly what the calorie expenditure that run is. And we use the running purely because a lot of boxers still want to do it. Now, I'm not a massive advocate of running in boxing, <laughs> which uh, when I was on the British Board of Control was a bit of a shock to the pro coaches in the room. Like, wow, what the They're fuck? Like, um, what, what are you on that, about? <laughs> that, the, other thing, the other thing got me a lot of trouble was I, I do not allow boxers to shadow box with dumbbells. It is a complete no-go. Um, and that was like, you know, it was like the antichrist. So, but we do do running and a lot of boxers like the long steady state runs. I don't have a problem with it as long as ankle mobility and the mechanics of running are good because there's a propensity for higher injury rates uh, through running a lot of times, shin splints, everything else. Um, but I think for us, it's all about performance. So it's bang for buck. Would do you, if a boxer doesn't have a lot of time, if he's a pro and a lot of people don't understand this, a lot of pros are still working full time. They're not making mega money, you know, maybe yeah. making 50 hundred quid a fight or whatever until they get up the ranks. So you kind of want to manage their time a little bit. So we're always looking at what's the best bang for buck. What, what do we need to get and how do we need to get it in a way that gives them family time, gives them recovery time. Because we don't want them in the gym 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We want them resting. And re That's probably the hardest thing actually is rest and recovery. Try to teach these people to kind of like take a day off. It's like, mm. what? Why, why would I do that? You're like, because you need your immune system to recover. Get on it. Yeah. So, so we do a lot of conventional metabolic testing. 
um, but it's probably more feel based than anything else. I like to use the Pinoy, the Cosmen for a systemic overall body. So what your body's burning fats and carbs, you know, what your breathing frequency is. But I also like to use like the Moxie sensor, the near infrared to look at well, what's your actual muscle doing? You know, yeah. is your calf muscle working right? Is your thigh muscle running right? But generally the boxer, they just know they get taped up. Um, we don't really go too deep into it with them. Other than we may say, say Billy, for example, may say, look, the back leg oxygen saturation is not good. I want to put in some single leg work and just maybe tone mm. that leg up a little bit, put some stability in because we want maybe the hip to come in a little bit more in the rear hand cross so we get a bit more power. So we do a lot of that type of work with box. So a lot of what we do is really geared up to the biomechanics as well because we want them to be throwing hands right, getting power. Because every super bantamweight wants to knock someone out. Um, and that's that that weight division doesn't tend to have a lot of crazy knockouts because they're so light. But we're going to change that because we are we're building little beasts in our gym that they can make the weight and have the muscle strength and have the power. So it's, it's going to be quite exciting. So what are you looking for, Andrew? Then in regards to like if you're looking at metabolic efficiency, so the ratio at rest someone's using carbs and fats. What is there like a juice? You said you set the targets for the runs. Would you say at yeah. the end of the camp or midway through the camp, I want you at X percentage of each, like that you're burning at rest. Is there a percentage which you look for, like a split or? <sighs> I think that's really difficult. And I think that depends a lot on the nutritional intervention and, and base of the recovery. Um, I have mean, a lot of conversations with other physiologists about this, whether it should be like 8% fat, 8, 20% carbs yeah. in a, an RMR test, which should be 70, 30. Yeah. I don't think there's a definitive answer on it. I think it's a very individual thing. And I think that goes back to a much deeper conversation than cellular biology and, and cell signaling. I think I, I, I now just look for consistency. So I just look at week one, what are we seeing in the RMR? what we've seen in the VO2 and what we've seen in the substrate test. And then I'm like, okay, if they're very high carb users off the bat, I'm like, we may want to change that down a little bit. So we want to maybe look at carbohydrate timing. Um, it could be that they're maybe taking a lot of carbs late at night rather than early in the day. Um, or mm. it could be the other way around that they're maybe decided for some men's fitness things post some of the ketogenic diets and maybe suddenly they've decided secretly because it has happened. I'm not going to name who that person was. They know who it is. Um, a ketogenic diet and then suddenly the following morning you're getting crazy values you know you're getting like like 0.55 you're getting ketone stories you're getting a whole heap of things that shouldn't be there yeah but i don't think there's a definitive so we i will basically look and go right so your rmr is 2000 this week next week it's 2300 so i'm like oh what happened there you know how was training i'll go back through the train logs i'll look at was there a lot of sparring was there a lot of inflammation is that why it changed you know did they comply with fasting and you know, not taking like a, a panel chocolate in the way in in the morning. And then I'll just compare it through the camps. But I'm looking for, I think it's difficult with boxing because you don't want them purely fat oxidizing. You kind of, you do need a percentage, good percentage of carbohydrate to get that kind of nice. Yeah, they're not a, not, a, not a marathon runner, not are they? So. Runner. Yeah. So, and I think this is the problem as well we're up against is that the bulk of literature is based upon endurance. Yeah. So, you know, and there's a lot of issues around. So I, there's the, one of the big issues with boxing is to do with this. There's a paper out there from 1985, I think it's Gosh's paper, where he started to look at, um, you know, the physiological attributes of a, of a boxer. Right? And this is like the Scourge of the Earthers paper. I'm going to actually do a post about it. And in that test, he based the heart rate and lactate and made this assumption that boxing was highly anaerobic. And that became based on a mainstay. And I was in conferences where people would bang on about how boxing was purely anaerobic. There was no aerobic capacity. It was very minimal. And what we subsequently found out is actually the opposite, that boxing is predominantly 80% aerobic and probably the last component is anaerobic. Which is crazy, right? When you think that yeah. the ma majority of fighters will, well, at least the ones I've spoken to in, in practice will be doing one modality training. So like sprints, red zone. hill work, red <laughs> zone, you know, boxing sessions, sparring sessions. And I say like, what about like the base? Have you ever, do you ever do any kind of aerobic work? And they say no. And I say like, well, you're not really training that energy system where you're on the oh, back foot oh. and you're moving around the ring and you're breathing through your nose and you're trying to catch a break. You've not at, you're not training that energy system and it's one of the most important because you think the majority of a round of a three minute round, a lot of that time is spent uh, like moving, you know, yeah, keeping moving, distance, keeping timing, distance. Yeah. And then you then go in and switch the gas pedal on for the flurries, don't you? Yeah. The combination. Yeah, so. and that, but see, that goes back to good sports science, right? So that goes back to kind of your studies and what you've understood. And then you get these weight coaches that don't understand the mechanisms of the sport or the physiology of the sport. Yeah. And, or you get the super coaches that think an RMR and a VO2 max is like changing the world, but they don't actually understand the physiology of a boxer because they've never spent time really looking at what's occurring, you know, and then they kind of wonder why they get 
high level athletes. Or turning up or turning up to training, by the way, which is the thing yeah. I see is like there's so many coaches or I think it's it's more from S and C coaches I see a lot of because I do know a lot of physiologists and nutritionists that will go and watch sparring because obviously yeah. if they're trying to implement a fueling strategy, they want to be there to oversee it or at least see it yeah. once or twice in camp. But like S and C coaches not going to I'm not trying to have a dig at S and C coaches, by the way, but not actually going and watching their boxer do a sparring session it's like well you've spent hours and hours and hours in the gym trying to get their shoulder mobility right for them to punch better but you're not actually going to go and watch them spar for me it's 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 crazy that, that yeah i mean i i mean i've got an snc background myself but um yeah my, my issue with a lot of snc coaches is they spend a lot of time setting up their mobile phone against a dumbbell so they can get a nice film and less time and actually watching their client do the actual movement if they spend more time watching their client they get better results my issue with my essence is pretty much like that i think and this comes back down to this unified approach so if you've done any good quality level of sports and exercise nutrition you understand energy systems and you understand the fuel that's needed to get the maximal result an snc coach can then come in and, and decide that the athlete needs to go in a hypertrophy phase and bulk up and you start getting you know, your athlete starts coming in, you're like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? You know, and you start to get a bit of oxygen debt and you get a lot of kind of down regulation and you start to see a lot of things that are not ideal for what he needs to achieve in the ring. And I think this is a disparity a lot of times. People don't appreciate just what a good sports nutritionist can do. They can inform everything. You can inform the SNC coach of what you need to achieve, you know, right down to kind of protein requirements for that hypertrophy phase, you know, whether they need just a baseline to it or they may need a bit more because they're coming back from injury. You know, right through to conditioning, rest and recovery. Do they need the carbohydrates? You know, do they need to kind of, you know, maybe tailor off a little bit? There's a massive amount of things that we should be doing as performance nutritionists in boxing that's not just making weight. Mm. I thought it was. I thought it. I thought it was actually make weight, eat clean, and drink three liters of water a day. I thought that was just the blueprint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny because I like I'm a really old coach, right? So I mean, I'm, I'm be 49 ish, so I'm bloody ancient, right? So I kind of look at the younger generation and I think these kids must be switched on more than I am. And a lot of times they're falling into the same traps. Now, a lot of the reason is boxing is very territorial. <clears throat> so, and you know, because you've been in boxing gyms. Mm. It's very kind of, this is the way we've done it. It's always worked. And it's like, well, where's your last five champions? Well, it worked for us in the past. It's like, I'm lucky that I'm in a gym where they're very open-minded. It's very like a case of like simple things. Like I said to David, look, I quite fancy doing a core body temperature study. I said, so we need some core body temperatures and we need some probably rectal thermometers. And he was like, no one's going to be up for that. Because <laughs> I wanted to see the effects a uh, core body temperature over a heavy spa to look at getting a bigger idea of thermal regulation and what the body's doing. Because these are things that nobody really thinks about. You know, if your box is, is suddenly placed in a, a, in a competition with an athlete that turns out to be slightly better than you anticipated and is working harder, they're obviously their heart rate's going up, they're increasing skin temperature, their, their core body temperature's going up and it has a knock-on effect as well. And these are all the variables we want in camp to look at so that we can kind of adjust on the fly. Um, so they're kind of good that way. But I've, I consult a lot for other fighters and it can be hard work mm. because it's like, do you have your SNC training log? No. Could you get it for me? Oh, the SNC coach doesn't want to release it. I'm like, why not? Yeah. Why doesn't he want to release it? Um, you know, are you on a deload week? No. What's your periodization? Don't have one. It's like, what's your conditioning based on? Oh, that's what my SNC guy does. And it's like, well, he's not actually doing conditioning right here. He's, he's just doing strength work. So we need to look at, because that's one of the big things we, we, we discover with boxers as well is there's a tendency for SNC coaches to make them do red zone work all the time. It's like, you're in the red zone. You, you must be doing amazing work. Boxers inherently will always go to the red zone. If you get a good amateur coming through, their, their heart rate's always elevated. They're always 174, 175, right? They know how to hit the red zone. That's not a big issue for them. And they can maintain it because that's the nature of the sport. We need them less of that and we need them utilizing fat oxidations for early rounds. The early rounds where you're sizing up your opponent, you shouldn't be burning a lot of carbohydrates. Hmm. This is actually more for a professional game, not, yeah. not the amateurs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amateurs like fast and furious. Yeah. Amateur, you just want bump. But the pros is a completely different thing. And I think this is the bigger issue with taking an amateur into the professional circuit is that change. Maybe they'll start off a couple of four rounders and they'll go up. And as you start to pick them for the tens and twelves, they really need good energy management. They really mm. need good control of carbohydrate utilization and fat oxidization. That is the critical part, along with 
which is overlooked, heart rate recovery between rounds. That's a massive, massive factor. If you can so get them dropping, yeah. Which obviously then brings into play, like what you said, touched on about 20 minutes ago about the whole breathing in between rounds and sitting up straight and breathing through the nose. And one thing which I've seen yeah. as well, mate, is is the amount of people, when you watch like fights on TV or you see it in sparring, the amount of people that want to be in the corner and want to yeah. poke their heads around and they want someone needs to towel, someone needs to take the mouth guard in. And I always look and I always see when it's just one person that just takes the mouth guard out, they talk to them, they give them the water and it's just, they've got one thing to focus on and they can just listen to them. It takes so many things out of the equation because I can imagine a lot of fighters getting flustered because there's this guy's trying to take my gum shield out. This guy's trying to pour water on my head. This guy's trying to hand me a towel. It's like mental overload and increasing heart rate and stuff. So that stuff in between rounds, that yeah, is such I'm, an interesting area. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of cornered some fighters. I, don't tend to, I, I tend to be the second in the corner a lot of times. David McAllister and Matty, they are just, They've been around the block so many times. They're so chilled out in the corner. I mean, it's so, it's so lax. The days ago, it's so relaxed. They just everyone's. They control everything. They control the flow. They control the box of sitting. They don't do crazy cooling methods. Everything's just really nicely geared up. And it's like it's the most calmest corner I think I've ever worked. The ones with David and Matty and things because it's just so chilled out. They're just like, you know. And David's got a very good system of not overloading commands. It's kind of the game plan's already been set. So generally, yeah. it's very relaxed. And we've discussed this a lot about the importance of that. But one of the big areas that is probably, and we spoke about this earlier on as well, is this whole idea of fueling your fighter on the, on the fight day. Mm. It's kind of an interesting area because, as, you, as we discussed earlier, you're going to have a boxer and the first five fights can maybe go full rounds. And some others, like they just maybe knock out after knockout or stoppage, and suddenly the, the, the time is shrinking down and you're. You know, and we, we do pre-fight intervention. So we, we may do some carbohydrate gels or a caffeine intervention. We may, we may do something. And that's kind of, it's always a nervous time. <laughs> I try to work out when, because you've got this 45 minute window with some caffeine and you just try to work out when is actually, the, when they're actually going to come on in the billing. Is it going to go to time? Are you going to hit it too soon? Have you not hit it? quick enough it's 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 in these are the areas that people don't appreciate with nutrition and, and thing, things like that mate sorry to interrupt you with the whole caffeine thing it's interesting because it's either like you said if there's a delay and you want it to kick in when they actually get into the ring but then there may be some fighters that actually want it to kick in in the warm-up so that then they're feeling yeah. sh sharp yeah. and then they've then got the yeah. confidence on the ring walk that they've just had a sharp warm-up so the timing of that it's not just hey have some caffeine on fight night it's more, it's more than that, isn't it? It's more work. Yeah, and it, it comes down to like, I mean, obviously one of my research projects is looking at caffeine and we're looking at the effects on cognition and awareness because I think that's really what you're getting from caffeine. I've not seen enough evidence to suggest otherwise. But Asker posted a thing about, um, I, I think, kind of fat oxidization or something to caffeine and I, I've not found it myself that it's that, that much of an effect. That's just to do the way it's metabolized through the kind of parasantine and theophylline. But where it works definitely is cognition that whole awareness state, that's, that's the best. Now, the reason we're doing the research on it is that one of the things that's really important to us is boxing safety. So the more you can improve someone's cognition and ability to perceive a threat, the less chance of something bad happening, like a, a subcontinuous hematoma or something that can be career ending. And we've had athletes that unfortunately have failed medicals because they've had maybe a slight bleed other than a subcontinuous and quite rightly so, the balls went, their license is revoked. But a lot of those fighters, when I looked at the case studies on those fighters, a lot of that was poor nutritional intervention and poor fight prepping. So they're going in dehydrated and dry, which you do not want to do as a boxer, right? Because your head's at higher risk at that point. Yeah. So I think this is the other big area where nutrition's got a massive benefit is we, we can optimally prime the boxer for going into the ring in perfect conditions. Mm -hmm. And we probably should be managing hydration on the fight day as well, more than we probably a lot of them do, because we want to make sure that they're, they're peaked. And the caffeine, I think there's an avenue, and I'll know more once we get we finish the, the clinical trial and we have a look at the data. But I think for some fighters that are responsive to caffeine, because not all are, that extra ability to be switched on and alert could be quite quite massive for them. You know, really massive. Because it improves reaction time. That's one of the things we're looking at, is how much does it actually improve reaction time? Um, and that's all, that's all the higher end of performance. You know, can you increase hand speed? Can you... Can you increase the amount of punches that are thrown and sustained in a round? Can you can I increase can I peripheral vision? That's the things that make a big difference. And I think there's a lot of stuff still there to be done. It is a difficult one to look at, but things like when do you want that to occur in a fight? Do you want it later rounds? 
mm. when they're starting to fatigue and tire, do you want it in the early rounds? A little bit more cognizant. It's kind of, um, there's a lot of variables, but I think this is the thing that's exciting about elements of performance nutrition is there's a whole world of things that a lot of people are not looking at, which are more interesting to me than just the weight management. The weight management, I don't think of this, 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 this is the thing, mate, what we've literally just spoken about over the last 10 minutes there. We've spoken about how to utilize the different energy systems um, and what energy systems are used actually during a fight. We've spoken about the build up, saying like how, you know, caffeine can help, how they need to be fueled to the max to make sure that they can perform at their best to get through all the rounds. Um, and we've spoken about like things like immunity and testing and individualization. We haven't actually spoken about weight management. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, it's a, it's, I think it's a funny issue. I mean, I, over the years, I mean, I, I used to fight at eight to one seven. So I used to cut from nine to eight. I only ever cut four or five pounds. That's all I ever had to cut. Um, now I'm just huge. <laughs> so as you get older, you go, I don't know. It's, pod- it's a podcast, mate. So don't worry. No, no one can see I'm you. not actually that huge. I'm actually sitting pretty lean at the moment. <laughs> I promise. Um, so, but I find our boxers, we don't need to do that much weight management with them. They're all pros. They've all had very successful amateur careers. They know how to cut weight. For us, it's just been realigning how they cut the weight and leaving them to it. Just re-educating them that don't do it that way. Don't starve yourself for sessions. Don't come in for a spar session and go on. David will just turn them away anyway. So, um, so that's the important thing. I think the harder sell in a lot of ways for me when I was in a lot of consulting with like, you know, boxers involved in the elite pathway and stuff was try to educate them that if you're going to go in for a technical session, or you're going to do like a box off, you're going to do a sparring session, these are just training tools. So they're not fight conditions, but it's as close as you're going to get. So in order to get the best at your technical session, why aren't you preparing nutritionally? You know, it's like, it's like studying for an exam. You want to get the most information you can get before you sit that exam. So my whole big thing is, is always being like, let's make sure we can prime the condition so you learn something from the spar session, you learn something from the technical pad session that you can then apply. Don't just do it because it's a part of boxing because you're looking at it the wrong way. Now, the problem with that is coaching. A lot of coaches don't understand that either. So they just see sparring, oh, we need to get loads of rounds of sparring, we need to get loads of rounds of sparring. And we don't do probably as much sparring as a lot of other gyms do. We do a lot more body sparring and a lot more technical sparring. Yeah, because cool. at the end of the day, that's where you're going to win the fight. Just doing rounds for the sake of rounds and getting beaten up. Yeah, it's also it reduces the length of your career, doesn't it? If you're yeah, getting yeah. In, a, in an eight-week camp, if you're having three of those weeks or four of those weeks where you're getting take your head off spars, where you're taking a lot of damage, it's just, I always think like, what are you learning? Is it really that necessary? Do we, we kind of want to reduce that as much as possible? Boxing um, is a very technical sport and it's a really difficult sport. You know, you get people come in and think they can box and, you know, they realize the coordination that's needed just to throw a good right, left, you know, left, right, or kind of, you know, a basic combination even a hook with the right proper shoulder position is pretty difficult. And then you scale that up to two really high level fighters. And then it's like, it's a different world for movement and footwork and timing and distance, spatial awareness. And it just amazes me, just coaches like kids turn up dehydrated, you know, they haven't slept all night because they've been out with a girlfriend and they put them in a competitive spa. You know, and you get, I've been to gyms where I've just cringed because I've looked at our lad and thought, geez, our lad's in prime condition. He's prepped and going, the other kid's not. And you just know the other kid's going to get beat on for like X amount of rounds. Now, a good coach won't let that happen. They'll just stop the rounds. There's been a lot of times David just went, yeah, four rounds is enough. We're not going to give your other kid a beating. It's not, it's not worth it. It's not good for their career. It's not. But coaches, a lot of coaches have that old mindset where sparring is everything. And we're different. Less sparring is probably optimal for us. Less injury, higher chance of recovery, more facilitation to recruit muscle fibers long term, you know, better development mitochondria density and all that shite. But it just means that when we get them less sparring, we have better quality sparring and we have better quality technical sessions. That's it, it means that S&C is on point because they're not tired getting into it. Like, oh, they're, they're not injured their hands or their grip strength may be lacking. So there's a whole heap of variables that are always spinning. Mm. But you need a good coaching staff. And if a good coaching staff can buy into what you're doing and see the results, I think it's, it's like a Goldilocks moment. Everything comes together and it's, you can do amazing things. You know, and that's why it's good to align yourself. Good, good people. Yeah, 100%, 100%. With the nutrition, Andrew, mate, what's kind of like your approach? Say you, you're working with a fighter because my, my approach is I'm quite kind of like direct with it. Um, yeah. I say like, if you're getting punched in the head in front of a load of people, <laughs> um, I shouldn't need to motivate you. Like, uh, I, shouldn't need yeah, to, well. I, shouldn't need, I shouldn't need to motivate you. But obviously it's not as, as simple as that you do. 
Uh, what's your kind of approach in the way that you kind of go about nutrition? Because we spoke off air about how the mindset shift obviously is number one with the whole new nutrition to make weight. And then the second one, which I really want to talk about with you is the whole, Hey mate, can I have a, a diet plan? And I don't know. Yeah. You've got some yeah. Funny, funny, funny kind of opinions on this that you want to share, but yeah. What's, what's kind yeah. of your approach with it? So, I mean, my background originally was computer science and psychology. Uh, and I spent a lot of time doing a lot of clinical psychology work in my wife's medical practice. And uh, I ended up working a lot with patients that had to go based, they were too big for the operating table. So we had to cut a lot of weight off of them. And dietitian was struggling. So we, we, we set up an exercise and prescription group. And I learned pretty easy on that people love the fucking idea of recipe plans. They love the idea of it and they'll get the fucking PDF, I swear now, and they just don't do it. But they'll come in and go, didn't do it, couldn't get like six beetroot from Asda. They didn't have any. So you're like, so you just didn't make it without the beetroot then? No, I, I thought it would destroy the recipe. We didn't use the beetroot. All right, okay. You did see it said optional on the beetroot, didn't you? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you could have still made the salad or whatever. Yeah, you? yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. right. So I just gave up with that. I just thought, right, okay, so let's do a re-education process and sit with and go, this is a good piece of protein. This is a shit piece of protein. These are good vegetables that you can eat, bucket loads and you'll never put any weight on it. These are crap vegetables you don't want to eat. Mm. And we just do it in a very simple way. Occasionally they'll go, can I have a diet sheet or can I have a recipe book? And I'll be like, just go to Tesco's or Amazon and type in weight loss 101 and you'll get 95 trillion recipe books. But come back and tell me what recipes you actually cooked. And yeah. then I'll give you a proper Because you can type into you can type into Google. There's loads of Pinterest. You, I mean, even you have to go to like Tesco yeah, or wait, yeah, go, yeah. go to Tesco or Waitrose, they've got recipe cards as you walk in. Just just take 20 of them. <laughs> so, but what where the caveat with this is is like high level clients, people that want to comply and get maximal return will do it. You know, they will follow recipes, they will do it. I've got a few clients like that, high level boxers that will do it. But in my experience with pros coming up. They don't have the time because a lot of them are still holding down jobs. Yeah. They, they, don't, they don't want to have to cook. They need something really, really super simple. So things like just a care package, putting in what type of sauces they can use, that those sauces will last for a couple of months anyway, low carbs, the simple stuff, the kind of sugar-free stuff and all that crap. And proper like, examples of fruits and veg and proteins that they can have. And then they've got a reference point when they get the box, they go, all right, let's get this in it, let's get that in it, let's get this in it. And then it's just a case of teaching them how to cook it. You know, but we're in a good position. I was in this software, you know, we get, you know, one of our lads is, 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 you know, even date nights where the other half is doing like spaghetti bolognese, but making spaghetti corgetti and stuff rather than pasta. And he's giving the missus the pasta. Um, oh, brilliant. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So they're starting to learn about quality choice. You know, he's actually grinding the meat himself. So he's buying like decent steak. He's got a mincer and he's making his own hamburgers that way. So they're nice and clean. And, and we do a lot yeah. of stuff like that with them. And I've got a nice, got, uh, of I live in a nice big house with a big kitchen diner. So I've converted, I closed my gym and converted our garage into a high performance lab. So a lot of times I'll get them down here, we'll do the test and then I'll take them into the kitchen area and we'll cook. Oh, I'll just cook awesome. them. And we'll just cook the meals and, and give them examples of, of very simple things. But there's others, that will t I mean, you know yourself, there's others that you'll say like, I want a diet, we, we don't do this anymore. I want a diet recall. Give me a three day dietary recall. And I've sat with them, I've went, there is no bloody way on earth you made a grilled chicken breast with 250 grams of couscous and roasted peppers. It's like, you don't even know what a roasted pepper looks like. Um, you know, so why lie to me that you're sitting over your gas burner roasting a red pepper when you're not? Um, oh, they might have so, had a blowtorch, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so out in the garden with a big blowtorch, <laughs> uh, roasting peppers. So I, I just... So what I try to do with some of the fighters that are a bit more switched on and want to do prepping... Mm. is I will maybe at the weekend say, I want you to roast these amount of vegetables in your oven, chop them up, put them in a box, and every time you have a meal, just take a scoop of them with your meal. So take your chicken breast, grill it, take a nice scoop of those roasted vegetables, do a bit of dressing, you're good to go. Generally, in the whole, our guys are pretty okay. I would say the biggest issue is they don't have a varied diet a lot of times. It's, mm. it's default back to the same type of things yeah it can be quite difficult to try and yeah. when, when you are trying to hit targets and you are trying to keep i just think that's simple as best if you're trying to make like i don't know green matcha chia seed puddings or whatever like it, it's very hard for you to use that mental capacity to kind of think of these crazy yeah. ideas when you're trying to when you're focusing on so much more important stuff like the whole you know their recovery heart rate their sleep all that kind of stuff you're, you're not like a chef and you're not going to come yeah, up with those Yeah, so kind of the, the thing that always makes me smile, you, you get a lot of 
sports nutritionist Instagrammers that have got the, the super duper cacao protein balls. I've never had, had a, I can't, mate, I've never had a fighter that's made energy balls. I've never made one. I, 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 and I look at it and I think, wow, how many, um, how many boxes on a Sunday afternoon are thinking, I'm going to have done a way through this, get myself a nice quality cacao powder, and I'm going to get some nice dates, and I'm going to, it's not going to happen. Um, that's where you, know, you just I mean, need something basic, a banana, a gel in there, a gym bag. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, anyway. so we we have a lot of cyst gels. Um, we have a lot of the protein bars are like, kicking around occasionally. Um, if an athlete turns up and we just think they're not fueled adequately, we'll just say, right, we'll swap your session for a couple hours and then just grab a pro, you know, a cyst energy bake bar, get a drink, sit and just chill out and we'll make sure they're fueled. We won't let them just train completely on empty. Um, yeah. So we've always got a reserve of that stuff sitting. We've got protein in the gym so that um because you know like you you want to make sure everything's informed so it's all through the informed checklist batch number yeah. tested so we have protein sitting for them so they can come in and kind of after their s and c session the protein's there they just go dump it in their shaker and they're good to go we just thought supplying it and having it ready in the gym kitchen area was a much better way to change habits 100%. Then say to them when you go home i want you to go and cook like you know two chicken breasts and kind of chickpeas and whatever else um, so we find having a lot of stuff on hand helps. Um, times I kind of think they don't appreciate it. Things, um, you know, that it's all there because it costs money. You know, somebody something we don't have to pay for it. It's not like they're paying for it on pocket. Because this is the other fantasy world that people, you know, like outsiders looking in think these pros are making loads of money. Mm. And a lot of these young pros, illness, are not. They're, they're still roofers or carpet fitters or, you know, they're yeah, working yeah, manual yeah. jobs. And that's the other thing. I had this not long ago with. Uh, I took on a private client as a boxer um, from Manchester area and his nutritionist hadn't factored in. He was like roofing and the kid was up and down scaffold and like loads of times. So the RMR was all over the place. And it was only that sat and said to him, how often you got him down the scaffold and stuff. And, so, ah, and sometimes I'll do push-ups or off of this and I'll do pull-ups here. And, and I was like, oh, that explains your RMR values. Uh, and his, you know, he had done a crazy deficit. I think he was taking like 700 calories in a day and expending like two and a half hours. It's just like crazy. It's just, it was like, wow. Mm. wow you're not going to survive um, do you think like a better approach if i was to be trying to put it on the other side of like i'm the boxer and i'm asking you hey andrew can i uh grab a can i grab a diet plan can i grab a meal plan please what, what would your straight up I, answer be I, I would say no because we don't do them but what we'll do is we'll, i'll spend an afternoon with you and i'll go shopping with you and I'll, I'll bring into the kitchen and i'll show you how you basically boil an egg um, you know, you store your egg in the fridge. I'll do that rather than do it. I, I just feel... Better use your time. It's, yeah, and I just feel it's like, I know for a fact, because I've done it for long enough, that if I give a diet sheet or a menu plan, the compliance level is pretty low. Because I think everybody loves the idea of it. I'll sit on their phone and go, wow, that looks amazing. And then they'll look at mm. the ingredient list and go, oh, God, I can't be arsed. I've just come in from work, I'm tired, I've got a training session in an hour from now. I'll do it when I come home and then I'll come home and it'll be like, I'll just have like a stoats or it's porridge bar or something. And then you start to see a massive influx of carbohydrates, which at the wrong time, you don't really want it necessarily that time. Mm. I mean, we like to do carbs pretty middle of the afternoon, um, ready for training sessions at night. I'm less carb heavy. I like them a bit more protein based at night. So we can like train high sleep low mentality just helps thermal regulation a lot more better. Um, so we'll kind of do that type of thing with them. But generally we try to make it super easy. It's just like chicken, beef, this is the type of beef you want to get, this is the type of chicken you want to get. We'll even do like, you can get it at this shop, you can get it at that shop. Or if you're lucky and you get a good butcher's, which we've had, they'll do like protein packs. Yeah, nice. So, when so you get kind of, so and we've spoken to them, they'll do like sausages as well, high protein, low fat sausages and burgers and that crap as well. And, and one of the things I'll do with my um, sort of like professional fighters, mate, is I'll say to them, well, first off, they'll say like, hey, can you update my plan or can you update my meal plan or what should I be doing on this day? And I just flip it on his head and I say, what do you think you should be doing? And they give him five seconds, 10 seconds to think about it. And I'll say like, what training are you doing today? So I'll rest day. So I'm just going for a walk. Say, do you think that you need to have banana and date porridge today? And they'll probably go, mm, probably not. I probably should have an omelette with some veg or something, some avocado. And I'm like, that sounds pretty decent. Yeah. Send me a picture of it. Yeah. Um, and then you know throughout the day how much should i be drinking and how much do you think you need to drink do you think you'll be losing a lot of sweat and they go no because i'm not doing my in indoor boxing training and all of a sudden they start writing their own meal plan yeah yeah and that's the best way of doing it and i think um 
The other thing as well is when you start tracking, and we've done this with views like with critiques and reviews of a whole heap of different software and stuff. Oh. And a lot of times it will just overestimates or it underestimates. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll just do like you did, I'll just say, just snapshot your plate, just send me a photograph. Mm. So, you know, when when um, when Darren Trainer was fighting Carol Frampton, we it was probably the easiest weight cut he's ever had in his life. And on that week, because he was in quarantine for the week before the fight um, last year, and uh, it was kind of funny. All we did for him was we just removed a percentage of his carbohydrates from his plate. But he still was eating fish and steak and, you know, his weight cut, you know, he was on point, no dehydration, nothing. Just completely. And afterwards, he was like, that's the easiest weight cut I've ever had in my entire life. And I was like, well, it's the, probably the only style of weight cut you should have had in your entire life. Yeah, he shouldn't, you have shouldn't have ever done it. He shouldn't have ever done anything know. different. Well, you get crazy things. I was saying this to Ophir, but, you know, Kind of last week, a Muay Thai fight, I was wanting to cut a massive amount of weight in like three weeks' notice. And, you know, and his excuse is, is like, I always find I need to lose the water in order to make the weight. And I'm kind of like, why? Why don't you just go up a weight class? Because the boys are too big in that weight class. And you're like, well, size advantages and everything, because it depends on how you're training at that size. So, mm. you know, and do you really want to be dehydrated in a big title fight and coming yeah. in not at your best? You know, and it's, and I it's think bizarre to me. It's, a thing which a lot of the people use, like you said, those guys in America or weight cut specialists and whatnot uses is, is the water is a water load. What's your kind of take yeah. on one, the water load, and then two, what would you have your because I think this is really useful. What would you have your fighters drinking and fighting? Because people think that, okay, I'll either do a water load or I have 500 mils of fluid a day in fight week. There's no kind of like, why don't you just drink normally? Why don't you just drink two, three liters? Why are you drinking 10 or zero? What's yeah, so we, we don't we don't waterload. I've never waterloaded. Um, even when I competed, I never waterloaded. It was not, not even something I, I thought that I had to do. Um, no, no. So, I mean, generally, they just, they just drink normally. We just keep a check on <coughs> hydration status. It's something we keep a massive check on during the week. Um, but we kind of want them coming into fight week not that far out anyway. So the last two weeks, we probably want it to be a, a kilo, two kilo, maybe three tops out, so that it's a very easy cut, you know, a very easy cut. Um, so like, like Darren's a good example because he was like six kilos out four weeks notice short notice for Carol Frampton mm-hmm. fight and that mm-hmm. was an easy six you know what I mean you can take two kilos pff, a day pretty easy if you had to do it through just a bit of sweat loss and everything else but generally I would rather have a longer time period to get the weight down if it was a, if they were quite far out on weight I'd rather the, I'd rather we did a heads up but generally our rule is is we don't let them go that much that too far out anyway because i think if you're a professional athlete and you want to be fighting and this and i think this is the best time for boxers to understand this because we have had lockdown for quite a long period of time when the doors open and more fights happen it's going to be crazy it's going to be fight galore and there's going to be a lot of fighters that are not in shape that are not going to have it so opportunities for fighters is going to be massive at the moment so this is a good time to get your weight under control if it's not in control yeah it's time to grab something yourself something to eat and get sorted because it could uh, nice, just nice plug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, online program coming soon. Um, it's not. Um, but I think it's a good time because I think there's a lot more opportunities are going to open up. So, I, 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 I mean, I like 7%. I like if you're not in camp, 7% outside your fight weight. I think that's a nice percentage for me. Now, I find super bantamweights uh, and the smaller fighters tend to be there. You know, mm. like, you know, you may have a 56 kilo fighter maybe sitting at 62, 63 or whatever. It's not a big problem. I find the higher weight classes are slightly more trickier. You get a, t- a higher propensity to put on a lot more adipose tissue. You tend to see that a lot more. It's harder to come off in the other way. Um, mm. So I think the lighter fighters tend to be much easier to stabilize and sit around. But generally, I'm just a big advocate. Uh, be close to your fight weight because you never know what opportunity is going to come up. You're yeah. also training all your S&C around the right weight. So the contract- contractile measurements, so the, kind of the myosin and all that good stuff yeah. is all in place and everything's primed to go. I just don't like ballooning way up and then coming down because what they don't see, which we will see when we start rmr them, is long-term over time, the metabolism will shift. You know, there's an amount of flexible kind of RER R- R- values and stuff within metabolism as you look at it, but over time it will come harder. When it hits the 30s, it's going to be harder. Psychologically, motivationally, it becomes harder and the whole process becomes much more of a grind. Whereas if we get it earlier, and get educated sooner i think it's less of a grind for them to do it. i think it is important to note as well to that it is important to go 
um, come off that kind of diet, quote unquote diet, I hate that word, but yeah. that dieting yeah. phase out of camp and actually be in a calorie surplus a bit, but just have, like you said, like a percentage yeah. that you don't want to go above a weight target because that's good for that metabolism to, to come back up. You don't want to be progressively just kind of dieting or in a deficit the whole time out of camp or eat clean out of camp. It needs to be strategic, but it's not a all out binge, go up 10 kilos. It's okay. We're going to yeah. put on a little um, bit more fat mass yeah. because we lost some fat mass. We're going to repeat that process again, but yeah. I think the amateurs is a bit is a bit more balanced at times. I think because they compete so often, yeah. you know, and, and sometimes multiply and kind of over a weekend if they're doing that championship or whatever. Don't tend to have a lot of massive issues with amateurs. Um, Pro is, I think, it's different because they're maybe not competing as much, so there's a higher propensity just to kind of pig out and just chill out. We are kind of lucky with our lads that they're all they're all actually not too bad. We've taken a couple down um, from eighty six to seventy four to set for kind of like middleweight and stuff like that, and, um, which has been pretty straightforward to do, but it's now a case of educating them to stay that way rather than building it all the way back up. And a lot of it is, like you were saying earlier, you know, like if they have a down day and they're not training, they sometimes they forget that they can't take the same amount of calories up as, as the day before. You know, I mean, occasionally what will happen is, is they'll miss a training day or work will kick in the next day and they'll miss two training days. And then before you know it, they've hit, you know, it's three training days and they made a kilo up and stuff but i don't like making them super conscious of weight either in the sense no. that i don't want body dysmorphia or any kind of psychological symptoms to kick in so we kind of tend to uh, we have a we have our own like back-end performance website we coded or we track things um so i just like them to weigh in every couple of days just i just go just wish your weight this moment and just keep an eye on it just as a passing comment and i'll go out of it such and such and such and such today uh and that and it's only really if we start to notice in training that we're starting to chunk up. Yeah. Then we'll start intervention and sit and go, look, what's going on here? We are. But then it's, you know yourself, it's it's more than just training. It can be family life. It could be their kids not well. It could be their parents not well. There's a myriad of factors you have to take into consideration, you know, to, to kind of to, to make sure everything's in place. It's, it, I mean, it is a difficult sport. But, and then you get the bigger topic, which I'd be interested in your opinion, is the low energy availability in reds. And mm. Yeah, I will, I'm going to try and get uh, Carl... Um, Carl Lang and Evans back on to talk about his paper on the um, physiological effects of that on that MMA athlete, that paper he wrote. So I'm going to try and get... Yeah. I mean, it's a, it, is an interesting, it is an interesting area because I think as soon as you're cutting weight, it's very difficult to hit that kind of, you know, 45k cal, whatever it is. And I think yeah. there's been a lot of interesting research that's shown that you can go pretty low and it doesn't compromise immunity that much as long as you're not in it for long, long periods of time. Yeah, and I think that's probably what I've seen over the years that the boxers that do deep cuts but don't stay there for too long, it doesn't seem to compromise immunity that much. Strength, I think, is a bit more debatable question. Yeah. But I think you know, but I'm not, I'm not super keen on people cutting crazy. You know, we've had in the past MMA fighters. That's a completely different. I don't do weight cutting for MMA fighters now. I, I tend to stay away from it um, just because I tend to find the weight cuts are just insane. And, uh, yeah, ridiculous. I don't want to be too involved in it you know it's like i'm 100 kilos would you need to be at 56 <laughs> like, not gonna happen the next four weeks um Start getting the chainsaw out and cut but i have a weight management legs. coach that told me i can do this um you mm. know on kind of low sodium low fiber and low residual foods and you're like okay so you're gonna be eating paper the next week. yeah the thing is mate we've spoken about this on past episodes of that these things are all great but if you are not arriving at seven days out or 10 days out without those tanks stocked up and you're arriving yeah. with those empty tanks there's no tanks to empty so it's like if you've got a fighter that's deprived of carbs or fluid or sodium or camp then you can't get to fight week and then try and reduce fiber if they've had two grams of fiber every day for six it's, weeks <laughs> this is the other interesting thing as well because so, so for body composition we use a mixture of things we use clipper and ultrasound and dexa uh, and the ultrasound is actually pretty good it's, it's because once you get it dialed in, it's pretty good. And it's always interesting when you get like a new fighter and, you know, they're maybe sitting at, you know, 72 kilos rather than 80 64 for talking sake, for simplicity, but they're sitting at 8% body fat. Yeah. And you're sitting with the coach and the coach is like, yeah, I think you can make it a bit lighter than, you know, 66 for whatever it is. And you're like, he's at 8% body fat. It's kind of like, what are you trying to do and kill him? Um, yeah, I was going to say, he's pretty low at the moment. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, most of our fighters sit between probably about eight 14 percent probably none of them none of them really tend to go beyond some of the females maybe 15 16 percent 17 but we tend to find that our fighters are relatively lean 
and because they, they, they walk around near weight so close anyway that yeah you know but that's 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 not that's not down to me that's just the way david does it generally so when i came on board it was one of the nicest things was that the weight side of things wasn't a massive big issue Mm-hmm. Um, but he's got a really good understanding of that. It's, it's not a crazy approach. It's a really switched on approach. Um, mm-hmm. But I've been in other gyms where, you know, your, your, like, tie boxers can be particularly bad. You know, they're already like super low body weight and they're trying to cut, you know, maybe 77% body fat and they're trying to cut another 10 kilos. And you're like, it's not happening. It's just, yeah. and you kind of wonder why you see all these videos of them collapsing in the toilet and, you know, and kind of been taken to the hospital and kidney problems. And you think, oh, it's crazy we're in a sport where if you think about the outcomes, it can go so catastrophically wrong. Yeah. And you get coaches kind of disparaging sometimes. Not always, so there's going to be some really good coaches out there that are quite disparaging again, nutritionists, you know. And a lot of that, I think, goes back to that whole thing about weight management consultancy and all that stuff that a lot of them don't appreciate the performance and what, what the outcomes can be. And I think, we, but when you do get a good sports nutritionist, it's got their athletes' interest. I think that's I think that's the key as well as I think a lot of people don't understand is that when you do work with someone that's potentially not that doesn't have the right morals or like a weight cut specialist or whatever and you buy an online thing for 200 quid what you don't realize is that if you they probably don't necessarily actually care about you as a person whereas someone like myself or Andrew I mean I speak for myself but I genuinely on a personal level really care about the fighters that I work with like really care and i would not do anything which would make their jeopardize their health or if i thought that they couldn't make a weight class or i've got the objective data to say like yeah you can't fight that weight class and i I just will say like look listen i'm not going to take control of that and and help you do that um i've said what i needed to say you can't do that weight class safely i'm not gonna watch you basically dehydrate yourself to get to it Um, yeah i agree with you i think it's i think it's the best way forward i think it is changing i think I think you just need a lot more education. I think if, um, especially at the amateur level, like English box and Scottish box and stuff, did a bit more emphasis on the nutrition side for coaching, especially like amateur yeah. coaches, they could have quite a massive change because a lot of that's pretty old school. You know, you're talking with your coach or your volunteer, you maybe get a kid that comes box and then suddenly a coach is like, give us a hand. And before you know it, you're on a box in Scotland level two course, getting your badge and you're like mm. taking kids to shows and stuff. I think, I think it will come with time. I, I still think that, the problem that boxing has is probably more the MMA side of stuff and the way they do weight cutting and you know people then think I mean I I, I know super high end boxers that are now employing more MMA specific sports nutritionists yeah and I don't know and I, I still can't rationalise in my mind why would you do that you know and it's like it's like an afterthought we're going to take them to the end of our camp and use them at the end of our camp and I'm like well a good sports nutritionist should be with you through your whole camp and feeling and prepping you and getting the best of it. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about, can we improve your technical ability through interventions until you get the maximum amount out of that session, which then transfers into sparring, which then transfers into kind of ultimate performance outcomes. It should be like that. But I think we're changing. I think it's happening. I think it's a bit slower than I would have liked. Uh, I mean, this is like... I think, with anything, I think with anything, Andrew, it's, it's just the case of if, you know, it's time, it's going to happen at some point where people will just have to catch up and the more and more if there's more and more champions or elite level professionals that are doing these things it just sends the message to everybody that they have to they have to get on board the same ship otherwise that they're just gonna be left behind on the on the, on the shore do so. you mean that means more people need to do social media posts uh, <laughs> which yeah gonna i'm gonna i said mate you're gonna you're gonna need to fire up the instagram account and get yeah the hash, i know the hashtags it's, just, out. It's, it's kind of funny you know i think it would quite a lot i think um mm. um it's just never been a massive draw for me. I just, uh, I have some serious questions in my mind when I see a lot of Instagram posts. I think, you know, if you've that much time to set that shot up, why didn't you fix the hip position in the back squat before you actually made them do the back squat? I have these kind of bizarre thoughts. I don't understand that. Um, I understand that business is slightly different. And we are, we are a little bit like now as well. Like, well, we should really probably do a bit more social media presence and it, post what we do. And It's and funny. It's, it's really off topic. And the listeners probably think like, oh God, I'm going to stop listening now. But it's like with my dad, mate, he's just started investing in a, in a marketing company to basically do his marketing for him. He said like, look, I can do this. This is my business. This is what I do day to day with the customers. I don't know. I don't know anything about marketing anymore. I used to put an ad in the yeah, yeah, local news, paper. local newspaper on the radio, and they that would be it. That would be done for the year. Advertising done. Yeah. He said, 
I don't know what LinkedIn is. I don't know what this is. I don't know how to use Instagram or it's just like, I don't have any time to be focusing and I wouldn't do a good job. So it's just handing it to somebody else. And it's gotten to the point now where, you know, people, you know, if you look at even like Connor Ben, he's got his own YouTube channel, which yeah, I was, was going to say, I think you know? for young athletes, I think it's really important. I think, um, I think that helps the game. You know, I've seen this years ago when we were working with Robert White for the UFC Glasgow. That was one of the big things the UFC wanted was a lot more film work and media and you know, doing a lot of films as training sessions and everything else. And I think the UFC is a good example of that for young athletes. They want a social presence because they want the followers. And boxing, when you think about it, then these pros are still it's selling business. They're on tickets so they need to have a little bit of that. So if they're looking in shape and they look, you know, they look good, then I think it probably helps sell some tickets and everything else. But Mm. it's an exciting sport to be part of I think and I think um, the performance side I think the next few years is going to explode because there's loads of interesting things coming out um, research wise which uh, could change the shape of boxing in a lot of ways and the understanding of it which will be good and uh, I like being involved in it um, it's kind of uh, I just um, so you want to make sure boxers are safe and well that's, that's my big interest is, is boxing wellness Awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's so nice to see as well, that whole kind of approach with the health, the performance and bringing that level of care and sports science stuff, mate. Um, just to wrap things up, because I'm conscious of time we've been waffling yeah. on for a, a long while know, now. Sorry. Um, sorry, I'm glad we didn't yeah. chat no one's thought. Yeah. <laughs> Those, um, if anybody wants to co- kind of keep tabs, because I do have some listeners, mate, that will will want to read those papers or find out more about it. Those kind of the papers that you're working on, do you want to just run through them and what they're a little bit about, like brief summary, what they're about yeah, and when yeah. they're going to be so able to yeah. read? So I'm not sure when, because obviously we're waiting on uh, ethical approval because of COVID to get some of the, the actual physical testing done. But we're doing first paper we're doing is, um, is caffeine and looking at the effect on cognition uh, along with some punching metrics like sustained hand speed, et cetera. So, that paper is going to be using um, pros and hopefully the Boxing Scotland national team. So, so coming up, basically seeing if like caffeine can improve like hand yeah, speed reactions yeah, yeah. and yeah. what so the best dosages kind of and stuff. Yeah, so we want to see kind of what is the effect of caffeine? Is it effect or is it not an effect? Um, so we want to just have a definitive look at it, what it does and whether if it does work, is it because it's a dose response or you're a bit more receptive to caffeine than someone else? Because even, and it's an interesting paper because even though we'll have maybe like 26 boxers in this paper all high level, even if it was to come out to show that there was no major effect, but two people had a major effect in it, those two people that are dose responsive could have a massive performance gain and awareness as they step into the ring. So it's a win-win scenario, which I think is why Boxing Scotland likes the idea of it. The other paper is looking at concurrent training methods in relation to protein synthesis. So the conventional thought is if you do resistance training and then you jump on the treadmill or you go for a run, it negates your ability to build muscle mass. And that's to do with, I won't go too deep into it, but to AMPK um, inhibiting the mTOR protein kinase. Um, the other one we're looking at is professional boxers and substrate. What, what energy systems are at play with on the treadmill versus the bag versus sparring to have a definitive approach and what do you actually burn? How do you burn that? What percentage is fats? What percentage is carbs? Uh, the other one, <laughs> let's go for days. So the other one is looking at the, what is <laughs> so the how much to You must have about like 45 hours in a day compared to my 24. Ah, so I, I get up about six in the morning and I go to sleep about one in the morning I think at five hours sleep a day or something. I'm not, I'm, I'm probably a heavy red kind of <laughs> and reds a lot of time. But the other one um, we're looking at, which is probably more interesting, is a longitudinal study. Uh, we'll see how this one goes. Um, is looking at the effects of training on your rest and metabolic rate over a period of years. So we're, we're taking a couple of young and up and coming boxers that we think are going to be quite successful and we want to see does weight cutting and mm-hmm. does it have an effect long term? Because what we suspect in some of the cases we've looked at is that it does slow your metabolism down and it does have kind of some metabolic distress, you know, energy stress. Which so, which logically would make sense in most people's yeah. heads. You repeatedly do weight cuts, yeah. you repeatedly put your body under that stress and your metabolism under that stress and you do it badly. Um, or just do it in general, your metabolism will decrease and it will make it harder when you when you're 20 it'll be easy when you get to 30 it's yeah. going to get harder and harder each oh, time because you always you always hear fighters yeah. don't you say like it gets harder every time yeah um, and coaches will go oh it's just because you're not trying hard enough and you know <laughs> we had we discussions up north about this you know like especially for women it can be a lot harder in the, in the mid-30s to cut the weight I mean, you know, always see yeah. that quite a lot and the other paper i'm doing is looking at is more a clinical paper looking at inflammation processes uh and how inflammation occurs why it occurs um 
and especially in athletes that suffer from any kind of rheumatology conditions, psoriatic arthritis, and those conditions of a high protein turnover. Okay, all of that. So, so my kind of life is split. Uh, 50% practical and 50% theoretical. And it's kind of trying to mesh the two together that interests me. Um, mm. Because this is one of the pet hates that I do have is that you'll see a lot of coaches post some bits of research without reading the whole thing. And they'll yeah. just post the abstract and they'll make a massive conclusion. Or they'll look at a paper that was something to do like 12 swimmers swam the breaststroke in 35 seconds and suddenly like, you know, they're doing it in boxing, but it's getting more sport. For me, for, over. Yeah, and for me, it's a case of literally exactly the same as that. Well, I still have a lot to learn in fairness, but which is a good thing. But for me, it's a case of trying to bridge that gap and say like, say that you measured rest and metabolic rate as an example. And it, I've seen lots of people, like you've just said, just wanting to do it because they've got the equipment or it looks yeah. cool for yeah. social media. What implicate, and it's also saying like, okay, maybe your rest and metabolic rate is X and you need to have this many calories extra per day. But it's actually like practically, what does that actually look like? Does that look like you, you can now yeah. have an extra snack before you spar, which could be carb based? It, could it be you could add more rice to your main meal so you feel fuller at that point where you get hungriest most of the day? Or could you have some yogurt or some smoothie before bed to help with the you know muscle growth and repair? It's little things like that. It's like, how can this boxer actually benefit from this data? Like, how, how is this implementing? Same with the heart rate recovery stuff. Um, so, yeah, trying to bridge that gap between it's. The complicated science and yeah so so we when we do a, a full metabolic profile and we do a whole physiological test we kind of report it and we kind of tend to sit with the coach and break it down and say right this is like round one this is what occurred this is round two this is what occurred etc and then we'll say we would like round two to be more like round one or round four to be a bit more around like round five or just even physiological tests and we'll say to them you know this is kind of how we score you you know you're like 70 percent. we want you in the 92 percent. we need to change this strength part we need to change this training protocol here or this we try and make it really really simple um and i think it's i think it is difficult i think when you start getting into like the deep ends of physiology uh there's so much happening even energy systems is something that people don't really understand you're still living in this concept of you know first couple of seconds you know it's kind of creatine phosphate and all that stuff and you know, you, you don't understand that all the energy systems that are at play all the time. They just depend on intensity level or a different level of contribution. So you're kind of like only ever really anaerobic at a biochemical point of view. You're never really anaerobic as such um, or kind of aerobic as such. Everything's always in, in unison and your body's very good at doing it. Yeah. But it's is, it is like, you know, for us, it's, it's a bit, for me, it's like a selfless pursuit really in a lot of ways. I'm looking to try and identify what is performance in boxing physiologically what what can we see what can limit a boxer is it respiration or breathing is it maybe cardiac maybe they'll just not get enough kind of cardiac output training so they get too high a heart rate we need to settle that down or is it more metabolism we need to change substrate utilization and it's these are the things i think probably give the best changes in performance for a boxer is identifying what a limitation is yeah you know it can be a simple thing you know, like maybe the kind of the, the plantar flexion, the, the dorsiflexion, the range of the toes, the shin bones, not adequate. So when they're deadlifting, they're not really getting proper power generation because they're restricted. So in the ring, as, they, as they're leaning heavy on the front foot, they're having to overextend their jab a little bit. So they're losing speed because the shoulder position's out of position. And you can see maybe a two kilometer hour change in the, the position of the hand. So all that really geeky weird shit. I'm like, it's four in the morning drawing diagrams and going, oh, can I yeah. through this? <laughs> you know, I mean, we are my approach is very marmite some people love it a lot of people hate it um because it's very data driven so we are yeah. on very like we'll film spa sessions with all the sensors on and then we'll get the video i'll come back edit them we'll overlay all the data live so the box can sit with the team and we can sit and watch every single second of that box and spa session with all the metrics your hand speed oxygen saturation level desaturation value recovery time and we can then say right round four you can see you started to throw some haymakers. This was the effect that it had. Yeah, and then practically that might look like something like, hey, in round four, want you yeah. to maybe move around the ring a bit more, maybe go on the back foot and then come stronger in round five yeah. or some, something like that. But yeah. that's that's the practical, that's collecting the data and that's the practical advice yeah. you give so, off the back of that, which is so yes. useful for a fight. So Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, we've had spar sessions where we're able to say like, you know, you're leaning very heavy in the back leg. So your, your muscles, you know, your, your rec fair muscles working really, really hard. We need you a bit more on the front toes. Or in other occasions, we're like, you know, in a competitive spa, when two kids have got their moxies on, we give them competing advice. So I'll maybe go over and go, I want you to clinch the boy. 
mm. a bit more because he's 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 a front foot fighter. I want you to pressure him on the back foot and be a bit more grindy with him and make him fatigue out. But I'll give the other kid the other advice so that he stays away from him. So we kind of start to develop gameplay and strategy. And they start to understand it. And we'll debrief them. We'll say, right, here's your data. How did you feel? We're at round one, how did you feel? And they're like, ah, blah, blah, blah. And then a lot of times we can say, right, you already know psychologically around four you're struggling. But this is the reason why you're struggling. So we can go back into the gym now and we can dissect round four and we can look at the punches you're throwing, the way you're throwing them and the position you're throwing them in. And we can alter that so it's not going to happen again. And that's, that's kind of my view in performance. It's like taking all of it together as a big puzzle and putting it together and saying, right, you know, we're going to improve this, this and this. And these are all the components that you need. And the foundation is always movement, biomechanic assessment, physiologic assessment, and nutritional assessment. That's the foundation. We built everything up from that. And that's what then gets us nice in our blueprint. And it's no different to a boxer or a cyclist. We'll do the same as a cyclist. Mm-hmm. We'll look at kind of the same thing. They're slightly different. We'll look at functional threshold and all that stuff. So. Well, it's definitely the right way to probably go about things in a, a, a blueprint. It's a super way. boring and geeky for anyone listening, but it's kind of like, if you're into science and weird, crazy laboratory stuff, it's, it's super cool. Um, but I think this is where it's going to go. I think, um, you know, I think, and I've said this to you before, I think you're doing things the right way. I think, I think it's always good to see, you know, sports and nutritious in the gym working with athletes in their environment. I always think that's a fantastic thing. I think that's the only way it should be. I think you need to have an appreciation for the sport. Well, I don't know how to, I always say like, I don't know how on earth you would be able to know how to fuel a session. Because if they just wrote on their RPE six or seven yeah. scenario spa, if I've actually seen it and I've looking at the heart rate data and I know that it's actually quite technical and it's actually, we don't need to be so heavy on the fueling side of it, which then has implications on body composition. If I'm over fueling them, uh, metabolic flexibility all that kind of stuff but if i know that the sparring is really difficult we know that we can you know fuel up for it properly and stuff but you won't know that unless you see clips or you actually watch a couple yeah. of spars and stuff so yeah definitely got to be definitely got to be on the ground and involved Absolutely. it's also great it's also great fun as well if you're if you're actually passionate and into it and you want to watch them spar that that's that's what gets to me mate is that the coaches should want to give up an hour of their evening because they want to watch them spar not because they feel that they have to because it's like it's part of my job description as part of the team but i yeah. could go and train somebody else and earn another 50 quid quickly it's more of a point of you should want to go and watch them because they're like your fighter and they're like your product your you know your they're your product at the end of the day aren't they that one of your fighters is a product of all of your work so yeah i think i think it's, i mean it is tough i mean i, I know having coached at amateur and pro level myself it's it's quite time demand and it takes away from your family time so i closed my gym in the end i wanted more time with my teenage son and my wife uh, i barely see her because she's busy the gp um at the practice but i want a bit more balance um and the good thing about the way we do things now as well is that once the programs are in place i can remote do a lot of remote work and with tools like moxing things we can do remote analysis because i can have the, the, the sensors on have a live stream from the gym and capture all the data remotely so I can look at it from distance. Because once the, once the kind of template or the plan is in place, it's just a case of kind of making those tweaks yeah. and getting the boxers to make those yeah. adjustments themselves as well. So if you've got like a, a schedule where they're sparring Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know that the breakfast or, you know, whatever the routine Because Aberdeen, I mean, I'm based in central Scotland, so Aberdeen's a good around 15 minutes away from me. So... So we're getting camera set up so we can get multiple points of sparring and I'll be able just to live in and just watch it live. And that's, that's kind of all I really need to see. I, I can, I'm in a position now, I've done this for so long that I can walk into a gym and watch a boxer on the pads and probably discern pretty quickly biomechanically where it's not working for them or where it is working for them. And then pretty quickly after a movement assessment, I can probably gauge where on the S&C program they, they really need to change to get a better you know, output for power or speed. Yeah. Uh, and the metabolic testing, as you know, is, is, is a bit more complex because you need that fasting period and you have to get them to come in and stuff. And then technology is... Uh, that's the hardest thing about my job isn't necessarily the job. It's the bloody technology and Bluetooth. Because <laughs> when you've got like hand sensors, you know, moxie sensors... Boom, 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 all going off in the gym. Crazy. It just takes somebody to come in and go on Facebook and the whole thing dies. Because <laughs> somebody that just absorbed all the bandwidth. You're like, shit. Um that's the hardest part is, is, is technology, especially when doing trials and research. It's like, you know, the mercy of tech. Um, but on the other hand, it gives you... One of the cool things about weed, what we do is it's, it's very difficult to get a good understanding of the physiology of an actual spar session. Mm. 
But nobody in research has really been able to do it other than in between rounds take a lactate blood test from the earlobe or get them out the ring and, and do like a, a metabolic test kind of after they came out the ring type thing. But yeah. We've been lucky that the tech that we're using has allowed us to get actual spar data through 3D motion capture and other stuff as well. And it's been quite a heavy investment to do it. But that's, I think, where the magic is, is when you can kind of actually see under proper conditions with cortisol and adrenaline kicking in and you know, how they actually respond to pressure. And, you know, there's a lot of variabilities on fight night that are difficult right down to temperature. One of the things that's crazy from a nutrition point of view, and I'll finish on this because I'll, I'll let you go and get back to your life, is <laughs> you, you take like a boxer in a gym, right? There's no lighting other than the gym line and then you mm. catapult them to like sky tv and suddenly they're under film lights and they're under a lot more heat and it's always it's been a big area it's always kind of fascinating which is why we're now doing these core body temp studies is how does that transfer across in our performance factor like the heat of the lights and everything else versus you know should we be hydrating them slightly more um should we be carbon them up a little bit more is a higher amount of energy bleed from the fact that the temperature is suddenly a lot more than what they're used to Especially in Scotland, where we live in sub-zero temperatures all the time. We don't even know what sunlight looks like half the time in Aberdeen. It's like... You're going to say, I'm looking out the window behind you there, and it's... Uh, yeah, it's like It's, it's, like like it's midnight, yeah. Yeah, so, like, when we see sunlight, it's, it, it makes you go back shit crazy. And artificial lights, like... Phew. So there's, there's a lot of variables, but I think... I think it's exciting times. I think what you're doing is fantastic. I like the way you've been doing things. It's really, really good. And I think, you know, more like-minded people, a community of people working together, similar projects, I think be pretty exciting as well mm, brilliant so if anyone's anyone's up for that i'm up for that <laughs> well listen mate thank you so much for coming on to premiere season two of the podcast uh, no, thanks, okay. thanks for giving up your time i think it's going to be really useful uh conversation for people to listen to maybe to listen to in two parts because it's quite <laughs> <a> lot, but, <laughs> and if they can understand you but yeah thank you for yes. taking the time to come on if people want to find you not in a creepy way but if they want to read some of your research or see any of your instagram posts because you do put out a couple of of, of posts so they're really useful every, every where, can, um, where can people follow you mate uh so on instagram on the andrew usher because another andrew should still on it before i got to it swing um and evolve performance uk's instagram um facebook is evolve performance uk i think and the website's evolve performance.co.uk don't tend to put out a massive amount although i'm at the moment going through an idea of doing like a, a weekly boxing research breakdown where i'm planning to take a paper a week and just dissect a little bit look awesome. at what the pros and cons were and what the practical application could be so that's what i'm planning and starting up fairly soon awesome well i look forward to um, having a read through those papers when they come out um and I'll share them as well on my sort of social so people can get can get a read of them and get a bit more exposure. But yeah, thanks for taking the time, mate, and uh, enjoy no the rest of your day. Cheers.